Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome back to another episode of Out of the Blank. Steven, it's a pleasure to have you back on. How's it been, man? It's been like ages. Yeah, it has been a while. Uh, it's been a busy time uh, for me, as I'm sure it has been for you. Uh, and there's been a lot going on. Uh, the astronomy has been in the news a lot lately, as you know, for some that telescope. very good reasons. Uh, yeah, yeah. The James Webb Space Telescope is doing its thing. Uh, and it's And it's working really well. Did, so did it just get more accurate, accurate pictures of what we had before, but actually was able to clarify things where, because when I look, all I've really seen about it has been like, I know it has a, a, a insane capabilities, but when the photos came back, there was like the ones we originally took. And then there's these ones and they're like higher definition. Like if you just went from um, watching movies on your phone to upgrading to a movie theater screen. Yeah, yeah, right. It's like going from HD to Ultra HD or something like that. Um, and it, it, the interesting thing has been that it's gone through a period of what they call commissioning for telescopes. That's where they're just like testing it out and making sure that everything works. And so an understandably good way to test it is, hey, let's look at something that Hubble has looked at. And then we can do a direct side by side comparison. That's a, just a, a, a makes sense to do it that way. And so one of the first things they did was they looked at a very famous um, uh, image called the Hubble Deep Field. And the Hubble Deep Field was something that happened uh, a couple of decades ago, fairly early on in the uh, Hubble uh, mission, where the director of, uh, of Hubble had some discretionary time. And he said, you know what? I'm going to just point it at this patch of sky that looks completely black and stare at it for weeks and see what happens. And so they did that. And when they looked at the image, it was full of galaxies. And that just became this moment of self-awareness for our species that, oh my God, the, you know, the universe is so amazingly large. So that's a, that's a well-known image from Hubble. And so they thought, okay, let's see what Webb can do if it looks at the same space. Uh, now there's a, a couple of differences here because Webb uh, has a slightly different wavelength uh, range in that it mostly looks in the infrared as opposed to Hubble, which looks in the optical. So that means that Webb is more sensitive to thermal emission of objects. Uh, but it was able to take a deeper image than Hubble in the space of a few hours. Uh, so it was it was quite an extraordinary improvement. Like you said, it just uh, the, the resolution looked better, everything looked sharper. It also did it in a much shorter time because it's a much bigger mirror. Uh, so it doesn't need to uh, stare as long at, at the same place. But anyway, yeah, that's what it's been doing, uh, looking at a lot of things that Hubble looked at to say, hey, look at the improvement we can make. But now it's moving on to new things. So, so, so it's done with the commission looking at old things, and now it's moved into its actual science program. Would it be capable of being able to detect, let's say if it's using thermal, is it going to be better at maybe noticing certain features or characteristics about planets or these things that we call icy moons or whatever, and being able to figure out that if there is something that we might have missed the first time? Yeah, and that's a big part of its uh, mission is that it's going to be looking at the atmospheres of planets. And the uh, interesting thing about the uh, the infrared wavelengths that it's using is that there's a lot more sensitivity there to absorption, what we call absorption features due to molecules in the atmosphere uh, that we're really interested in things, especially things like water. Uh, so if there's water vapor in the atmosphere, um, uh, Webb will do a much better job of detecting that. Uh, so that's the sort of thing we're really interested in. That could be sign that there's also surface liquid water. Uh, so that's what uh, it's going to be doing a lot of, a lot of that kind of work. 
for some of the planets we already know about. Since we talked, I've probably talked to a lot of people that probably deal down that you probably know what transhumanism is the idea of technology and inside your body. And these type of people that want to think of like advanced humans and these aspects of like merging yourself with machine. Um, a lot of that does sound like sci-fi, but if you talk to them, it sounds normal. But a lot of their discussions do link in things with what you would call futuristic stuff. And a lot of these futuristic technologies or capabilities happen to do a lot with space travel, space colonization. And I'm curious, with even with the telescope, James Webb, do you think that we're heading in the direction of space colonization? Or do you think we're heading in the direction of just trying to figure out what life else is out there, if there is life out there? I mean, if I bring up the idea to you that maybe people have now adjusted to the idea that we're not alone in the universe with the amount of UAP topics that are out there now. But imagine if I told you that, imagine we might not be capable for an aspect of we're normalized now to the idea of an alien. What happens if they're just other humans on another planet that might survive off different circumstances? I mean, you can use that same thing I just said in two different circumstances when searching for life or space colonization. Is there someone that has adapted to conditions that aren't like conditions on Earth? And I, I think this brings up a lot of interesting things about Tristan. If we dive down the rabbit hole of um, exoplanets, I mean, we're learning more stuff about them every single day, uh, discovering new ones realizing that there are ways now we can terraform planets to be able to i mean that's more of a out out there concept but i mean hey i mean with enough time and research we could get there yeah i it, the, there's a lot of interesting things to unpack there which uh, one of which uh, i would say the, the the fundamental question we're trying to answer with web is uh how common is life in the universe is is life a natural byproduct of uh, rocky planet evolution. In other words, if you have a planet that's like the Earth that has surface liquid water, uh, is uh, is having carbon chemistry uh, progressing, is that just a natural process that, that produces all kinds of life? Now, uh, my, my suspicion of the answer to that is yes, uh, that there's a lot of life out there, but but that's uh, different from. Uh, from intelligent life and and the production of techno signatures and and the kind of uh, cases that you're talking about where uh, civilizations might have adapted to different environments using technology because the question is how do we detect that so there's this difference here between biosignatures just the signatures of naturally occurring biology and that's something that we understand pretty well from an earth-based uh, analysis of, of all the different uh, chemical pathways of organic chemistry that we've observed and insofar as we can predict it, what it would look like on another environment. But techno signatures that, you know, I've got a lot of friends who work on techno signatures. Unfortunately, NASA is now supporting the science of techno signatures. And by supporting it, I mean, actually funding people going back down that direction. There was a period of time when NASA wasn't really funding things like SETI and so on for, for, for many years, but now they are again. And it's interesting talking to my colleagues who work on techno signatures because part of the problem there is, whereas with biosignatures, as I said, we can kind of uh, understand the biology and how that would manifest in the atmosphere in a natural sense. But when you're talking about techno signatures, you're probably talking about civilizations that are hundreds if not thousands of years more advanced than us and when you it, it's hard to predict what that would look like what would a techno signature look like and, and we get trapped in this frame of thinking about um well we know what we would build if we had infinite resources i don't know maybe we'd build uh, a death star or something <laughs> some kind of some kind of a spaceship something that we've seen in star trek but that's just thinking within our limited box of what we've developed, both in terms of science and science fiction over the past hundred years. Uh, and it's hard to, I, I, I really um, empathize with my colleagues who are trying to predict what an advanced civilization would build and what the signature of that would be that we could possibly detect. Well, if I would 
say probably make a large statement and say i think humankind has to expand their category of what we call intelligent design or what we call intelligence like if we say we're searching for intelligent life is different than just searching for life i mean depending on how complex that biology of whatever we discover is i mean the main fears just don't bring it back to earth like i don't want to see like how suicide squad happens for the giant starfish starts <laughs> killing everybody but i mean in a sense you look at like being able to find resources. Is this place valuable for us? Can we have conditions to go on it? Very, very kind of selfish little, I would say things. Um, I do bring in the point that when we talk about intelligent design, I think you need to start. And I think we should have noticed this by now. And I've kind of learned this from talking more about renewable energies is that this planet is very complex. Um, a lot of his issues are complex. Just the whole being to me just seems sentient. And I, I know people would say that's like a religious thing, not saying that, but I'm saying that there's a lot of things like plants, for instance, we know some can speak to each other or connect through their roots. Like there's a specific area in Africa where they can do that. I mean, if you're just talking about a planet that has no biological entities of life in the form of a human or a form of some type of, you know, two arms, two legs in that sense, could it still sustain life and then you get down to like looking at microorganisms and bacteria and all these other types of things but also you look at the aspect of maybe you know like in the movie avatar where the trees have all these connections and have all these types of things to it i mean that could be a possibility too and i think these are all really interesting concepts which makes everything even more damn complex and it's just like you're looking at like where do we start how do we go forward i like to see the idea of not just focusing on the ones that are just near our orbit um like the moon or mars or all these there there mars is a good is a, i would say a good space just because it's a good enough distance away and we've only landed a rover on it it'd be cool to have like a a person land on it but I think we enter the category of when we leave this atmosphere, we got to make sure that we're paying attention to things that necessarily aren't going to be in our focus in 10 years. Like right now, we're looking at like a lot of people are worried about climate. So they're like, maybe we need to find a new home to live on. I don't think that's a good goal to be trying to find a new thing to go out there for. I think you need to look at the idea of what else could be out there and then like our perspectives 10 years ago, for instance, are not the same as our perspectives now. So think about what is going to be valued, valuable to us in 10 years. Is that going to be finding a new element on another exoplanet? I mean, asteroid mining is a concept that's tossed out there. How do we get these rare metals and precious things off an asteroid? I think the last one that uh, came close to Earth was like rated at like $5 million or $5 billion or something like that. And that was just because of a, a, a rare minerals and chemicals that were on there. It's just like, you get into this aspect of like, okay, maybe right now I'm not thinking about money, but in maybe five minutes or 10 minutes, will I be thinking about money? Like just go into space with that idea of like, expect the unexpected, but also you're probably going to end up wanting that unexpected. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's, um, uh, there's a document that comes out every 10 years, which we call uh, the Decadal. Uh, that is a document that is intended to be a consensus of the community, meaning the astronomical community and the planetary science community. This is what our science priorities will be for the next 10 years. So it gives NASA and the funding agencies an idea of, of, um, of what we plan on doing. And the, these Decadal documents tend to have very long time scales, like several decades. Um, but we can't think that far in advance, realistically. And so the way in which I think about these documents is that it's it's just telling us a direction to steer the ship, you know. And so there's going to be all these currents, you know, and things which move the ship around. Maybe we won't end up because, like you said, our priorities are going to uh, going to change a lot. And um, and trying to understand what it is that we're looking for, because, like you said as well, um, <laughs> as we learn more about these things, I mean, the Earth is a living planet and it is extremely complex and as we learn more about it there are connections between various things which we didn't expect i mean you often hear things like if if, if all the bees disappeared then that would have this knock-on effect that would destroy the ecosystem um, but even when it comes to climate change i mean when it comes to global warming 
uh, people might naively think that the at that everywhere the temperature raises by a certain amount. But as we've seen over the last couple of summers, I mean, I live in Southern California, and the temperature in Southern California last summer didn't get much above 100. And yet in Canada, we saw temperatures that reached almost 120. I mean, that's, uh, that's crazy, but it shows that, uh, that uh, climate systems are extremely complex and that there, there's connections, uh, not just between the various parts of the planet and how uh, temperatures change over land mass as opposed over to ocean mass, but the ecosystem itself. You, you, it's really difficult to anticipate how one small thing is going to change something else. And so uh, the, as we think about doing something like going to Mars and colonizing Mars, you know, if we, if we uh, eventually get around to that, like I said, I think that's a good direction to steer the ship. We don't know if that's where we're going to end up, but even just getting to Mars, it's going to be, there's going to be complexities there in terms of things like it, or how do we exploit the resources of Mars to make that sustainable? But what are the long-term effects on human biology of living uh, on the Martian surface where the gravity is about 38% of the Earth's gravity? What does that do to human body circulation, all that kind of, like there's, there's all kinds of uh, things that, uh, that we haven't even thought of yet. Uh, that's probably gonna change our direction. Do you think Mars would be the place that you'd want to like if you if I could place mission control in your back pocket to be able to point which planet we should go colonize on first? Where would would you say Mars? I think I think Mars is our only viable option at the moment in terms of uh, having a human presence there. Um, I I do worry that as I was hinting a few moments ago, I do worry that there is going to be long-term effects on human biology that we that we haven't fully, I mean, we've done a lot of research on the effects of zero G on like from the International Space Station. Um, those are usually uh, fairly short-term, short-term meaning uh, months to maybe a year or two, but, um, but the, the effect of living on Mars for years uh, I, I don't think we fully understand yet what, what effect that would have on, on the human body. I don't think you would be able to stay. I think you would probably be able to do trips up there, like stay for like maybe a week or so, but a long-term stay, I don't think is possible. I think there was Neil deGrasse Tyson who mentioned there's a book or a movie called The Boy from Mars. It was about a kid that was born on Mars. And then I think at like the age of 12, they had to leave and they had to go to Earth. So they all went back to Earth and the boy had never been there with that gravity. And I think after like a year or so, he died because his bones couldn't handle it. He couldn't adapt back to the situation. The weird thing is, is like we can adapt to less like from Earth's conditions. We can adapt to maybe a little bit more gravity or a little bit less gravity or maybe a little bit less water, a little bit more water. But I don't, the, it's like, Earth is a really strange planet in the aspect. I feel like this is the template. You can choose to upgrade or you can choose to downgrade. Now you can, I'm not talking about like the aspect of like um, your, 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 uh, you know, your living standards. I'm talking about, you can build up a civilization on Mars, but I mean, eventually are you going to be able to go back to Earth's conditions because Earth's conditions might be so completely, it's like going, switching, going from like California, not even California, going from, uh, give me a mountain region, like the Tibetan mountains all the way to Arizona. It's two different climates. It's going to be very, very difficult for you to adjust, but they're still on the same planet. Now take that into a bigger thing where everything's just fucking orange and that's Mars or, or red, whatever you want to call it. Like that's going to be a little bit, not only a shock to your system, but eventually you're going to adapt to this new condition. And it's going to be very, very difficult for you to try and to adjust back where there might be a sense of, depending on the time scale, we could talk about, let's say a generation. Then you have people that are, don't know what earth is like, and then they try and travel there and they can't leave whatever their pressurized tube is because they can't adjust, their bodies can't adjust to that gravity. Yeah. You know, one of the things I think about a lot in the context of our solar system and exoplanets is, um, we don't have what we call a super earth, which is a terrestrial planet larger than earth. Uh, earth is the largest terrestrial body in our solar system. Uh, and so it means that wherever else we go in the solar system, the gravity is going to be less. 
like we're saying, gra uh, gravity on Mars is about 38%. But, and, and so it means that wherever we have a human presence, if, if humans spend uh, a long time at that location, that, that there is going to be degradation of some sort. They're going to get used to the new conditions such that it would be difficult, if not impossible, for them to ever return to Earth because uh, it's, it's, Earth is just a more extreme environment in that sense. Um, if we had have had a super Earth planet, a more massive planet with high gravity, then yeah, we, we, <laughs> maybe we could have gone there and, and gotten used to more harsher conditions and, and become more robust. Um, but uh, unfortunately, that's not the case. So um, yeah, I don't know how that's gonna g going to play out in the future. I think, uh, I think you have to look at the aspect of where we might be heading towards where I said it's going to link into the futurist kind of talk, which is sending our digital children to these planets, which I, I would like to go get humans on there as well, too. But I think as we merge more with machine and AI, not in the physical sense, but more just in the capacity sense of technology that we use. I think the idea that Avi Loeb brings up um, when he was on my show talking about it was sending your digital children up there, you know, having these robots that um, might have like an AI or VR, some type of system that it can still be controlled by us, but help us explore more. I like that because it's not as much of an expense on the person. Um, you know, you don't have to worry about trying to get somebody back. I mean, I don't think NASA's really caring so much about how much money they lose on another planet and the idea that how much information can we pull out of it? I mean, if you could send a rover to another thing, it's just easier to be like, we can shut it down than trying to send resources to get it. But you pull out some crucial information. I mean, the stuff we got from that rover, that video, I know a lot of people were more worried about like, I don't know, something else that was trending at the time. I was like, we landed on Mars and people are like, what? Haven't we already done that? I was like, no, I was like, this is our first time doing it. And um, it's exciting because because it opens up the door to possibilities where imagine if we can get technology so good with space travel that we can start sending probes to other planets in such a rapid pace where we can be collecting out so much data in such a short amount of time compared to just sending man voyages. And then and that would cut down on half the time. Like we wouldn't have interstellar happen where we're sending astronauts to different planets and expecting them to come back with information. We just have probes that are able to feed us in real time. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting because um, uh, so I teach a, a, a class uh, called Planets in Science Fiction, uh, and I really enjoy teaching this class. Like uh, we talk about a whole bunch of different movies and is the science correct or not. Um, but uh, I also talk through different topics. And one of the topics is how do you solve the fundamental problem of traversing the distances between the the the, the stars, interstellar travel. I mean, interplanetary travel is one thing, but interstellar travel is very, very hard. And in fact, one of the answers to the Fermi paradox about why we haven't in, uh, had anybody uh, contact us yet is that civilizations eventually figure out that interstellar travel is just too goddamn hard. And so they just put on virtual reality headsets and, and go that route in, instead, rather than trying to figure out how do you design interstellar travel that would allow biology to survive those kinds of vast, vast distances. Um, uh, because the most common ones uh, that you see in movies, for example, I mean, of course, there's fast and light travel and all that kind of like um, warp travel that, uh, that is, uh, yet yeah, yeah, Star Wars, Star Trek, um, uh, there, there's a number of different solutions. You know, the earliest science fiction, the way they solved it was the only way that they could think of at the time, which was to not have a solution and to just construct a giant, what they call a generational ship and have it take however many tens of thousands of years and have people who uh, ar arrive there who are the, the vast descendants of the original people who, who left. Um, but a common one you see in movies like Avatar, you mentioned earlier, uh, is um, hypersleep, cryogenically freezing people for the trip, that's that sort of thing. Uh, but ultimately, it may come down to, you know, this is just too, too difficult. We don't actually want to do this. Um, so let's just put on the virtual reality headsets and send out the robots and do it that way. Um, and so that's <laughs> uh, obviously we would like to see some of the various science fiction solutions come true if we can do that some of that will require new physics 
especially if you're doing things like breaking uh, general relativity and traveling faster than the speed of light. Um, uh, but it, it, ultimately, it might be easier to just have a have a virtual component to it. A lot of this, I know you say it's like sci-fi kind of talk in a way, and we both can kind of say sci-fi talk. I don't think it's that sci-fi though. I think the idea that we can speculate it now, to me, just the idea, I think I take it way more serious than I did before. Mostly I started noticing, I thought science influenced society to do things. Now I'm noticing society really influences science in a large, large scale way, depending on if cryonics becomes more normalized, then that could be a possibility of how we're going to reach there. Depending on like, I love that space is getting more attention now. I think it's because people need a break from like the COVID shit and the politics. Me too. That's why I like talking about it because space is safe. Everybody can speculate as much as you want. It doesn't matter. It's okay. You can, it's a safe space. That's, I didn't even mean that, Um, (laughs) but the best part about it is that you can speculate, you can talk about, it, you can have ideas that can sound a little bit far out there and you can still kind of talk about these topics without someone rolling their eyes in a sense. But we get to the aspect of society influencing science. I mean, depending on where we start going forward with enough pressure on the idea of space now, especially UAPs, this scares me a lot, is that when you start – getting all this attention you start rioting or you start trending getting hashtags to trend now the government has to address it now they have to figure out how we can figure that whatever this thing is thing is out and you look at the aspect of exoplanets if you're talking about colonizing on an exoplanet which enough people that go into the space topic end up hearing about exoplanets and then start wondering if we can live on another planet they go well how are we going to get there if i pitch you five plans right now you know robots cryonics hypersleep, time travel, whatever you want to say, depending on how many people hop aboard, one certain topic is the direction that they're going with. I mean, and that's what springs up even scarier, like we were mentioning off air about private billionaires um, taking space trips and everything like that. It's interesting and it's fun, but also at the same time, you don't want your billionaires directing what used to be the space program. You need your scientists that know the research that are actually passionate about the thing, not a business person that's just trying to find a way to get their name on something or try and find a way to, you know, get money for themselves by building a hotel on a planet. I mean, that's the whole thing. Is space going to be just for space tourism or is it going to be for space colonization? Is it going to be for space resources? Is it going to be space warfare? I mean, these are all directions that are possibilities only because everything is so we, we have enough percentage of ground covered, but still so much left over where it could end in any, any of these territories. Yeah, before we get on to that topic, I just want to um, uh, agree with your previous topic about how science and um, and culture, if you like, are interacting with each other. I looked into that a lot when I was when I was teaching my class, and it is actually really interesting because people are definitely inspired by science fiction. Because you you mentioned cryogenics, and that's that is an active area of research. I I did a deep dive into the scientific literature, and there's a uh, there's a lot of uh, well, not a lot, but there are a few companies out there that are actively trying to solve cryogenics for human biology. I had the CEO on my show. It's I think they call it cryonics. I don't know. If they, oh, cryonics. Yeah, oh, they, okay. they, they leave the G out. Ah, interesting. Um, but uh, but there, there's a lot of backwards and forwards there, and I I I find that a fascinating part of science science fiction because, like for example, uh, in exoplanets. When we discovered the first planet that orbited two stars instead of one, everybody was calling it Tatooine because of the reference to Star Wars and two suns. Um, but we see it go the other direction as well, because, for example, there's been a, a recent Ridley Scott TV show called uh, Raised by Wolves. And that, and that show is set on Kepler 22b, which is a real exoplanet, which was discovered by the Kepler mission. And so it's going... Uh, both directions in terms of the discoveries, but also in terms of the technology that we see portrayed in science fiction films, people want that. And uh, and you get people with enough resources that they want to make it happen. I guarantee that uh, Elon Musk and and Richard Branson uh, and Jeff Bezos all grew up watching their favorite science fiction shows. I mean, take Jeff Bezos, for example. He loved The Expanse, which was canceled after one season on the Sci-Fi Network, and he wanted to see what happened next. So he bought the show <laughs> and put it on uh, on Amazon. Uh, and so 
these are people who are serious about science fiction and that's obviously a huge inspiration for them. They're trying to make it a reality. Um, and, uh, but that leads into what you were talking about is that, uh, do we want that? Do we want that to be the direction that we're going? Um, meaning that it's being led by people who have the enthusiasm and the resources to make that future happen in kind of an unrestricted way. Uh, because as we were discussing earlier, there are, there are very few regulations or relatively few that, uh, that will, will stop them from moving in whatever direction they, they want. I, because I, like if, if, if Elon wants to go to Mars and I mean, there, there are international treaties about the moon and about Mars, but if you have the resources to be able to just dominate the surface of, of, of the, of the Martian, the, the, the Martian surface, then um, there's going to be very little that people can do to stop you. You know, the, 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 Interstellar police are not going to show up and say, now, come on, Elon, you need to, I mean. <laughs> you just reminded me of that freaking, um, they had a moon bar that was like on the space ride at like Universal Studios. And it's just marshmallow. And they're like, it's astronaut food. I don't know why. When you said Martian, it just made me think of that. But I think what I, I do accept billionaires doing whatever the hell they want when it comes to an aspect of, you know, space travel. Go ahead, go full force. I don't care if you want to research, you want to build a hotel. I don't care. But I want science to be there first. I think that you need to look at who's going to be the person that's going to like people can f want Bezos to do whatever the hell he wants on the Martian surface. I don't care. Um, but I, we need scientists there first. We need to get the data. We need to get the research. We need to get all that before even a civilian can really step up there. There needs to be a focus on trying to pull out raw, real data before it gets contaminated by whatever that we bring to it, um, start building on there, even mining on the moon's surface or whatever you want to say. There's issues that need to be addressed as well, too. I mean, when you have enough information and research on that exoplanet or on that surface of whatever you want to talk about, then you can start skepticizing ideas of things. I mean, I brought up a really good idea, which was terraforming planets to make them exoplanets. I mean, if you can if we're talking about asteroid mining, I started wondering, is it possible to be able to calculate an impact of a asteroid, depending on its size, maybe using, imp we also have people that study, I had a person on my show who studies impact craters. And um, I go, is it possible to like, maybe same impact, you can find out what size of an asteroid that was and be able to do the same thing, but on something farther away, an exoplanet or potential exoplanet, and then somehow hit it and maybe cause a change in its environment to change it into an exoplanet. I mean, it's not difficult to say. I mean, we talk about an ice age that happens on Earth and people, I thought it was a conspiracy. Apparently it's real. Is that we have another ice age that we're due. I, I didn't know. I don't know if you know what that is, but I've had a couple like huge, like people that I would never think talk about climate that brought that up. And I'm like, wait a minute. I thought that was like an Alex Jones thing. And they're like, no, that's, <laughs> it's real. And I was like, okay. But if we can bring like something where we add an element to a planet, I mean, we talk about the metals that are here, the stuff that we can talk about fossil fuels, we can talk about a bunch of stuff, but there's certain elements to this planet that make it different than every other one. It's not just our atmosphere. There's a whole combination of things that are going on that are somehow have been a massive amount scale in a chain reaction that caused the exact conditions that we have here. You can say that the diving for fossil fuels and producing of CO2 is causing a rising in the atmosphere. Okay. That's still a chain reaction through some type of events that are going on in there as well, too. When I talked to someone who studies the earth's core, he mentioned like, you know, the magnetic field and all these types of things that the earth has, they're trying to figure out like, is it cause of this? Is it cause of this? There's a bunch of like controversial areas. Now take that to another planet. Why don't they have that same magnetic field? Well, scan the planet, see what needs to be added there. You start finding out it's not just that they're missing appearance stuff such as water but maybe they're missing certain metals, certain things that this planet does have. Okay, so one of those $5 billion asteroids that we talk about, what happens if you just redirect it into that? Would that be enough to cause something or do something that might do a shift change that would at least make it a little bit more habitable than it was before? I mean, obviously, it's all very skeptical and all very, very sci-fi and controversial talk, but I mean, these are 
outside thoughts and stuff that I want to see explore space rather than a billionaire who's just looking to, you know, get two day shipping to your house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, like we were saying earlier, uh, I mean, it, the, the earth, we know that the earth is extremely complex and everything's interconnected. And I mean, we've been living here uh, this whole time and we still, uh, learning new things about the earth. Uh, we uh, know very little about Mars, which sounds like a surprising thing to say after the amount of time and money was spent on sending robots there. But, um, but there's a lot that we don't know about the interior. And like you were talking about the core and the magnetic field, that's a big thing for Mars because that ties into the erosion of the atmosphere due to the solar wind. Uh, there's, a, the, there's many things that we, that we don't know about it because one of the um, uh, common discussions with Mars when you talk about terraforming is one of the first things you want to do is build up a kind of an Earth-like atmosphere. But if you did that, the question is how would you sustain it? Because there's a reason Mars doesn't have much of an atmosphere. The atmospheric pressure on the surface of Mars is, is 0.6% of Earth's atmosphere. And so it's, it's, there's very little left there. Why is that? It's small, it doesn't have as much gravity, it doesn't have a substantial magnetic field, and so it keeps losing stuff all the time. So you'd need to do things in a sustainable way. And it's funny what you're saying about crashing things into planets. One of my favorite board games is a game called Terraforming Mars. I don't know if you've uh, heard of it, but it's, it's, a, it's a great game where uh, uh, people, uh, are playing the role of a company and you can play all these development cards to try and raise the temperature of Mars, add water, things like that. And one of the development cards is you can crash a comet into Mars to add water to the surface. Uh, and there are things that like that that you could think about about doing, but... Um, uh, uh, like, I don't like know what I'm more pissed about. Did you not have Monopoly or did someone stole my <laughs> idea? <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a great game. it's they put a lot of thought into all the ways in which you would change the atmosphere the surface of mars but but the problem with with this is that even if you do raise the temperature if you add oxygen if you add surface liquid water like i said you have to be able to sustain it uh earth the one of the interesting things about earth i'm constantly reminded of this by my earth science colleagues is that it has surface liquid water for almost its entire history, which was more than 4 billion years. That's a long time for a planet to maintain a temperature range between zero and 100 degrees Celsius, where it can, where it can maintain that. Uh, Mars lost that ability early on for very good reasons that we're still trying to understand. Um, but if we just add water, I mean, Elon earlier on, I don't know if he still talks this way, but he was talking about nuking Mars, you know, some kind of Bond villain thing way to try and raise the temperature. Um, but that's not sustainable either. I mean, well, you're going to radiate, he <laughs> radiates part of the surface. So that's not good. But, um, uh, but it, whatever you, whatever you do, it has to have a long-term view rather than a short-term view. Okay, this will make it habitable for the next maybe 200, 300 years, and then we're going to be back to the way it was. Uh, and that goes back to the complexity of Mars, the interaction with the interior uh, of the planet, the magnetic field, and so on, uh, that we need to understand better. So uh, all of this to say that uh, I agree with you, <laughs> that, that we need more data to, to not just go in and start building... 3D printed habitats or whatever they want to do on the surface of Mars, we need to uh, understand the planet, the processes on the planet well enough that we can uh, make it a sustainable environment long term. So one of the people I wanted to get a panel with you on um, is Andrea Font, and she is what they call a reader um, in the UK that's trying to figure out the origins of like how the Big Bang even came to be. You know, they're using a simulation that keeps you know, more data you put in, depending on what you have, it keeps trying to chalk up and, you know, keep going over and over again until it chalks up how the exact one we got is. It's very, very difficult. It's not obviously a complete 100% accurate, um, mostly because we there's data that we just don't have to be able to put in the machine to be able to do so. But I go, let's bring it back to what we were talking about before about the invention of AI and where we're going with technology in this aspect. Maybe not look at a planet as as soon as this asteroid crashes into Mars, it's going to change the surface and it's going to make it livable for hundred years. Maybe something that we crash into it that maybe in a hundred years, then it will be livable. 
You know, we're thinking very, very immediate in every single step that we take. And I really get that. I know there's a lot of pressure, but this is also a danger of when we talk about like things that media hype up, or we talk about things that we need to be very realistic with a lot of stuff. Sci-fi talk is fine. But when you're talking about problems, like people think that the planet's going to die tomorrow because of climate. No, it's not. But you need to worry about it. Sure, that's fine. But when you think like that, you start doing actions that necessarily probably wouldn't be that good if you had more time to think about stuff. So if we talk about instead of worry about getting to another planet now, what about making something for not your future, not my future, but for our kids future, our grandkids future? Okay, so if we crash something into Mars, you're going to see a chaotic period of about 50 years where the atmosphere is going to fluctuate like crazy. It's going to go back between livable, unlivable, livable, unlivable. Some person out there thinks, okay, well, I'll stay on it for the time that's livable. Then I'll hop off and wait till it's livable again. Then I'll hop back on it. Not how it's going to work. You wait for that balance to figure out, and then it slowly brings itself back, and then you're able to live on it. It might be sustainable for however long, but it might take 100 years or so. I say that, Bigo, we don't have the time. Well, that's why we use the simulator. We use the simulator with the data that we can collect off that planet and then just predict what would happen if we do this and see if it eventually creates something where there's a certain time period where it does fix itself. And then we find a way to speed that up. Yeah, that's a big part of what I think about in my research, which is that I'm trying to construct um, as, as fully integrated planetary models as I can so that the processes are connected to each other so that I can make predictions about the direction that it's going to go, the climate, the geology, how they all interact with each other. It's important to take them all uh, in, in, into account. But I, it's, it's true what you say. It's um, uh, part of the fundamental problem in thinking about this is that whichever way you go, it's going to be a long-term endeavor. And, you know, it's, this isn't something where we can terraform a planet in the same time it takes for a new version of the iPhone to come out. It's like <laughs> we, 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 need to, we need to be thinking generational uh, if we're serious about this. And, and, and that's very, very difficult for people to do, I would say, generally. Because, I mean, we're talking about Mars, but um, there have uh, been uh, ideas about also how to terraform Venus um uh which is a much more difficult problem to solve but if you were to do that then that that would take hundreds of years um but you know hundreds of years in the grand scheme of things is not actually all that long you know thinking as a scientist um to to think that uh a thousand years from now like when you think of human civilization uh it, two thousand years ago we had the roman empire it's it's bizarre to think that two thousand years from uh, from now, feasibly, we could have civilizations on Venus and Mars. I mean, that's that's in, in, incredible, and it's not all that long. But you have to think long term to put those wheels in motion. We gotta get some some way, or we gotta become. I guess get closer to an aspect of building like a space station or something outside of one of these planets that we can't necessarily live on yet just to monitor it and be able to check levels and check regulations and see what can be added and what can be something where we have immediate access. We can't just be firing off missiles or firing off things to add onto the planet from earth. We need to be like right there observing these things from like, a, like I always go to the, um, if I'm going to think of a sci-fi show to relate anything to, it's going to be the Orville. I like that aspect of things where like they're just floating in like a little bit away from the planet, scanning it and doing all these things. I mean, I don't think we're that far away from like we have the space station. I know it's been in the same spot and just kind of rotating around for a while. But I mean, can you not make another one or try and think of another thing where you can just add like a Power Ranger, smaller pieces that can just form one giant thing? I mean that seems easier to me than doing something where you're trying to just focus on going onto the planet and then working from the ground. I mean, I think that's important to pull research out of, but I think if we talk about a global view of things, you got to, you know, find a space is safe in a sense. I mean, if you're able to get a certain. Yeah. Part. What I, what frustrates me is that I, uh, I know, and, and, and my, my colleagues know that these are the kinds of things that we could do if we had, the will to do them, but it's it's difficult, and this and and because there's a, a a very limited budget that NASA has now. Then there's been a lot that's uh, that's been written about the difference between the NASA budget now and what it was during the during the Kennedy era. Um, 
and there's always the argument is of essentially the, the the pushback that happens all the time is well we, we shouldn't be exploring space until we've solved problems here on earth well uh, i'm sorry spoiler alert we're never going to solve the problems on earth we're never if we're waiting until the earth is some grand utopia it's like okay we've fixed all the problems on earth now let's explore space then we'll never explore space i mean uh, that's just my pessimistic view i mean the, the the earth is in a constant state of being broken in some way or another <laughs> um and so uh we need to set aside the resources to be able to uh to pursue these goals of other planets um and uh but it's it's it's, it's always very difficult to try and justify it with everything else that's going on. And plus the other issue that uh, comes up, and I talk about to my students about this in my class is the ethical issues regarding terraforming. Uh, because I, I asked my, my students, uh, do you think we should terraform Mars, for example? Uh, do you think we should turn it into an extension of human civilization or do you think that it should be preserved like a museum, you know, kind of almost like a national park? You could think of it as that. And uh, many of them uh, voted in favor of just leaving it completely undisturbed. They just felt that. And this is even without the possibility that there might still be life on, under, the, under the surface. I think that's pretty unlikely at this, at this point that there's any life, if there ever was any life on Mars, that, that, that there is, still is any now. I'm holding out for rock people. I'm holding out. <laughs> <laughs> they're, yeah, they're just sitting really still whenever the rovers look at them. Yeah. I feel like they just, they just look like giant rocks, but then you come down on the surface, they turn to like thing from the Fantastic Four or something like that. But but it's but it's interesting because even if we had the the will and the resources and everything that we needed to just go and make Mars the human civilization, whatever we imagine that we'd like it to be, uh, there's still an ongoing discussion about whether we should do that at all. Uh, and and so I find that uh, an interesting discussion. I think that might be an uh, an additional roadblock well there's a weird there's a weird gap of people the same gap of people that talk about depopulating or trying to find ways that we can just not have kids anymore to bring earth back to its normal conditions i don't look at preserving or fixing earth's problems before we explore space my concern is making sure that we can get all our p's and q's um lined up in a sense when it comes to people um people can't survive in small spaces together uh, that doesn't matter if you're family, that doesn't matter if you're, you know, friends, whatever, there's just a certain amount of viable time before you start going nuts, you need a civilization, the su surprising factor is that cities work, so, despite what people think with statistics when it comes to like, well, the number of sh gunshots and all this, I'm like, it could be a hell of a lot worse, you got to understand there's a lot of people here, and we're all doing pretty damn fine when it comes to just aspects of everyday life. But if you look at an aspect of just making sure countries aren't just I mean, we've been going off mutually assured destruction for the longest time. And then you have hypersonic missiles that are now being involved into the argument and then people talking about the whole war being transferred to cyber. I mean, we're always going to be at conflicts with each other and you just got to hope that doesn't transfer out into space. Right now, I think it's so new to where there's no there's no value in fighting with each other at this point in the game i think that evolves later but i think that's fine that's something we can work on later but right now i know we talk about like long game stuff working about it now to prevent that like long game danger or just be aware of the long game man the idea to preserve these things that are out there that we might not find any life on i mean for what historic value of like hey kids this is mars i get it but i also don't agree with that i think those same people would also think that you know we have to live and die on this planet because we can't infect another one i go i mean if it's a rock earth's a rock there was there's there's life here sure when it comes to plants you know it boils down even farther than that but on another planet, there could be life there as well, too, where I bring up the option 
would it be a safe bet to head in the direction of modifying ourselves to be able to adapt to those conditions? Or do you think it would just be like how we've always done and always changed our landscapes? If I ask you the question right now, the rainforest, you know, you always hear the rainforest is going away. You know, that's, that's man-made forest, right? The rainforest was just years upon years of Native Americans that were man basically manscaping the land and creating it in this way. That's that's terraforming. We terraform that. But then you now have generations of people. That's all they know. It's always been here. So they think that's natural. It's not natural. The earth before we were alive, when dinosaurs roamed, was a completely different landscape. You adjust to things that you like. Doesn't mean that when we talk about another planet, you know, another civilization wouldn't benefit off. You have to think of future people, much like people will talk about the energy crisis. People talk about they don't take account for future people, somebody figuring it out. I'll put weight in that. I think human innovation is amazing. I think there's always someone that comes around that does something, but you also can't bet the farm on that. You have to make sure that when we talk about space colonization, are you really going to chop your own foot off, hinder yourself from it, living on another planet only on the aspect of you want to preserve its looks or preserve what you've always known it to be? In 60 years, you're going to be dead. And then you got a whole generation of people that are just going to want to go there anyway. So instead of delaying time, let's try and find ways that we can do it, but do it correctly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so I'm I'm a big fan of planetary engineering. And so my opinion is, uh, let, let, let's go in and change it up if that's the beneficial thing to do. And like we were saying earlier, if we have sufficient data that... We know exactly what we're doing when we're going into it. Like we're talking about, this is this is a, a long-term goal. We're not going to go in in five years and change the whole thing up. We're trying to do things which are going to have long-term sustainability over hundreds of years. We need the data to be able to make sure that that's going to work. But if we if we do it that way, then I'm all for it. I'm all for it. Change, changing, uh, changing it up that way. Which direction do you think that we'll be heading in like in the next five years, 10 years? Do you think we're eventually going to get some type of small system built on one of these exoplanets? And if you do think I don't, it could not even be 10 years, let me give you a time scan between one and 50 um, to get on an exoplanet. Do you, you think that's possible? One and 50 is a safe number, right? Well, I don't think we're going to get the exoplanets anytime soon because that requires solving the interstellar travel problem just go to sleep but cryogenics cryogenic if we can solve cryogenic, but you see even if you uh even if you use cryogenics um brain damage. then that well it's it's still going to take thousands of years to reach these other systems and this is a case where we definitely need more information we need more data uh for for these planetary systems uh before we go there uh, because uh, honestly, for, you, you hear a lot um, about exoplanets, which may be in the habitable zone. And so they might be nice places to move to. But the, the reality is that we, we know nothing about them. Well, we know what the size of the planets are. Uh, we know how massive they are, so we can get an estimate of their surface gravity. But in terms of their atmospheres, whether they have surface liquid water, for almost all of these exoplanets, we know almost nothing. Um, and so that's and that's part of what James Webb is going to be doing, uh, is going to be measuring the atmospheres of some of these planets so that we can start to learn something about them. But the point is, is that it's going to take us the next couple of decades just to understand these exoplanets well enough uh, to really get a handle on whether there are um, uh, are habitable conditions and perhaps even life before we would even consider uh, sending people there. So it's going to be a long, um, multi-century process, I would say. Did anybody hook up the space web, uh, James Webb telescope with like any type of mechanism to be able to fire off, I would say, probes or anything to these planets? Or is that no, it's just purely, it's, it's purely observing. It's purely observing. Um, uh, there, there are ideas about sending, uh, probes very rapidly at 20% of the speed of light to the Alpha Centauri system, which is the nearest star system to our sun. 
Uh, it's just over four light years away. Uh, so if you send it at 20% of the speed of light, maybe in a couple of decades, it, it could get there. Uh, and by probe, I'm talking about something relatively small, essentially just a camera that goes through and takes pictures of the planets that are in the system, which would be really cool. Um, that's not something that we've done yet because we need to get this, this probe up to 20% of the speed of light, which is hard. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, the, so there are ideas like that that, that that people are thinking about. But, but Webb is just purely observing um, many of these planets to learn more about them. Have you touched the field of nanotechnology? I have not. Because I, I, I've heard a lot of it be used for like science purposes, especially when it comes to medical, um, mostly like being able to help out with like certain treatments and infections and things of that sort. But also there's a small area of people that go with like the nanotechnology that talk about maybe finding things to be able to pull out certain, you know, like you can use it for fossil fuels. You can instead of mining and creating a giant hole, you could have this technology go down and be able to extract chemicals or extract the fuels out for you faster. Or I start going, what happens if we just switch that for like surveillance purposes, where we just go to an aspect of, if we talk about probing another planet, let's look at the moon, find something, a little nanotechnology that you're able to shoot at the moon or be able to put into the moon and have it be able to scan and give you from the outer layer or the inner layer out where you're able to do a scan of it and be able to see from the inside out instead of looking how we're always doing and looking from just the outside and trying to find the way in, work from the way in out and see every other planet and see if we come across something that might be you know interesting for us to be able to look at a little bit differently. Yeah, that's interesting because one of the, and I indicated this earlier when I was talking about Mars and how little we know about Mars, um, one of the fundamental problems we have right here in our solar system is understanding the interiors of planets, um, even for the Earth, uh, trying to trying to understand uh, the processes that are occurring between the core and the mantle of the Earth and how that translates into uh, the, the the seismic activity at the surface is a very very active area of research. And the interesting thing, um, uh, one of the interesting things about Venus, which is Earth's twin. And we know almost nothing about uh, the interior of Venus. We don't know if it's anything like the Earth. Uh, uh, we would like to, because if, if they form the same way, actually as twins, then they should be similar. But we've spent so little time on the surface for very good reasons, because it's so hostile. Um, to, uh, what I'd like to be able to do is uh, deploy seismometers on the surface of Venus to try and uh, understand that. But I hadn't thought about the nanotechnology uh, aspect of this. That's really interesting. I hadn't thought about that application at all. There's a similar thing I also heard when it comes to, it was a guy who was talking about sustainable living. Um, he talked about uh, build, digital twins um, using AI um, in a sense that your building would have a digital twin. Uh, you could do the same thing with digital twins of rivers. It's actually very, very important when you talk about like you could notice that there could be pollution in it at the exact moment pollution hits it by just by using little sensors and everything to be able to detect small things, stuff that you wouldn't really you know notice. It would just be like very, very minuscule, like little micro dots that you wouldn't be able to pay attention to. But he went really complex into like digital living and all this type of thing. Sounds like metaverse stuff. It's not. It's real, but it's just like more automated where you can actually if your house, for instance, had an Alexa that was just built into it where it could talk to you and it could do all these types of things and be able to kind of, you know, progress with you. Same thing with kids in school. They would have a little digital AI that would grow up with them. So when a company buys the digital AI, it also buys you. It buys the more analytical version of you, but also buys you with your thoughts and your human emotions that give other answers and designs that this machine couldn't do. Where I just go, if we're able to scan a planet, we know we, the moon's pretty close. That's not a planet, but it's, it's, close to us it's probably easiest to pull out information to that compared to something else so create a digital twin of it you know find every single aspect if we talk about building scanning from the inside out build a digital twin of it then compare it and use it as a model until we can find ways that we can you know instead of just always looking through a telescope at it you have it right on this ar thing in front of you that you're able to see find ways to manipulate find ways to add surface temperature do whatever you need to and you can do that i'm not talking about just the moon i'm talking about with other things venus for instance we could somehow find out under the atmosphere i think it's the atmosphere that's the one bill nelson was talking about you could build a 
a sky city or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard ideas about sky cities. That's a good one. We'll get on the propulsion angle in a minute. (laughs) Um, But if you can get through that cloud layer and you go down and you can actually at least scan just the surface, the surface is fine, but you're able to pull a scan from that with like a drone, a rover, whatever you want to say, you bring that back, you can create a digital twin of that landscape that exact atmosphere, the exact conditions, it'll give you all the pressurized, every single thing. Now, if you keep it on there longer, you can even connect it to a point where you can still have the thing. It doesn't have to be just one scan. It could constantly be scanning and you could check the fluctuations and be able to start adding and mapping and trying to figure out what you can do to at least bring something there to where you can have a little small building to get more research out of because nothing's going to be being actually there in person. Yeah, and 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 as I mentioned earlier, that's a big part of what I do in, in my research in trying to build these models of planets, so you can have some predictive power about what would happen if you uh, if you increase the the power output of the of the sun by five percent, for example. What would that do to the Earth's atmosphere, which is then interacting with the interior? Part of the challenge in all of this is that each individual component of these models is very complex and so uh, so for example a very common uh, thing that people look at are climate models and so we've there are many climate models of the earth that people have used over the years and they've become very sophisticated but then if you try and uh, connect that climate model to uh, to an interior model that requires somebody uh somebody with that area of expertise who has built their own model and trying to uh, integrate those two to each other. And so the part of the challenge that we're facing is that each individual component is very specialized and having a climate model take into account, for example, volcanism uh, and volcanism is uh, integrated into the uh, the the operation of the mantle and the the heat redistribution that's occurring within the earth, uh, then that's get, getting all of those physical processes integrated with each other. But well, the, what you're describing that's the dream. That that's where we want to end up um, uh, with all of these models. And I don't say it as to crap on science at all or what we have information wise now. I just go, it would be a lot more beneficial to anybody who's trying to make a basis of these things off the models that we do have by making them as accurate as possible. And with the technology that we have, I think we have ways to be able to do that. I just got to make sure that we're, I don't think we should treat every planet that we want to make livable or every planet that we try and diagnose something on or be able to figure out the information from it. It's not all going to be the same. I think Venus is obviously we know the environment is different than Mars's surface, but we're still using the same methods of being able to extract and find out information from it. We're using one machine or whatever to pull out information. I'm not saying the James Webb telescope or whatever we're using to be able to diagnose what that is. I'm not saying that's a terrible way. I'm just saying. When we talk about cryonics, when we talk about nanotechnology, when we talk about, you know, digital AI, when we talk about all this type of stuff, you could use all of them in combination with each other, depending on which one you're focusing on first. I think this is an important way, which if you've noticed throughout history, mankind is always seen as like, there's gotta be one solution to this thing. And I'm like, well, Hey, let's, you know, we talk about renewable energies, for instance, I always bring up the example. Why can't we just do them all? You know, do they need to be solar? Does it need to just be solar? Does it need to just be this? How about if we work wherever, depending whatever your climate is, I always said like by state, you would regulate probably you'd have more solar panels in Arizona than you would in fucking Seattle. But, you know, there's there's examples where I just go. I mean, it's not saying that this is like the answer. It's just saying this would give us way more data than if we started this now. I think you have to look at Venus and Mars. Those are I, I mean, I know more about Mars than I probably do Venus, but. I think, you know, they can both be very obtainable goals to get to, but we got to figure out how are we going to use the methods for Mars? And then what can we use for Venus? They cannot be the exact same because the surfaces aren't the same. Yeah, they're very different nuts to crack. And what you said, like that, you know, you know more about Mars than you know about Venus. That That's actually true of everybody, including the people who exclusively study Venus, <laughs> because we know so little about Venus. Um, and that's that's where we need more data such that these models that, that were um, uh, w- w- will be accurate in their predictive power. So uh, so yeah, I agree. 
when we talk about venus can you give me some like specific characteristics about venus i got all i'm, I'm looking at a freaking map from seventh grade in my head in a science class so i'm trying to think like all right i know that venus is like the blue planet right that's that's neptune isn't it neptune's the blue planet uh venus uh is uh is covered with clouds and so we can't see the surface easily um and uh as i said before it's sometimes referred to as earth's twin that's because it's the same size uh but the similarities are basically end there um one of the things i always say about venus is that everybody has seen venus whether they whether they know it or not it is the third brightest object in the sky after the sun and the moon third brightest object is venus it's sometimes called the evening star or the morning star because it's up right after sunset or up right before sunrise um so very very bright everybody's seen it uh, tan, even if you live in a it? city it's tan but yeah 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 it's your background that's what it is that yeah yeah and uh and so yeah this, this background is is what it would be like to be on the surface of venus which is horrible because um uh, the temperature uh of the surface is about 850 degrees fahrenheit and it's and it's this is not something where it's colder at the poles of versus the equator it doesn't doesn't really matter it's quite uniform uh and so uh that's hot enough to melt lead that's and it's about the maximum i discovered last summer uh that it's the maximum temperature that my barbecue like the temperature dial goes up to is 850 degrees fahrenheit um but the the surface pressure is about 93 bars which means 93 times the atmospheric pressure on on earth and that's something that it's 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 a difficult concept to explain because you know we don't even think about the atmosphere of earth as something which is crushing us i mean we don't even really notice the atmosphere unless it's a windy day um but but 93 bars is equivalent to being at an ocean depth of almost one kilometer which is way below the safe scuba diving depth so your eyes would pop out of your head yeah you, you'd be crushed uh and the sulfuric acid in the atmosphere which is mostly carbon dioxide at about the 96 percent level um so it has has what we call a runaway greenhouse uh and so it's you know actually a post runaway greenhouse state so it's no longer heating up it's at this stable state which we don't know when this happened it could have had surface liquid water like earth in the past we're still not sure there's a lot of evidence that it was like earth up until maybe a couple of billion years ago uh and then something changed maybe it um it was because of the the brightening of the sun because the sun gradually increases in brightness as through time uh and so it could have been because of that but probably it was something more like it lost the ability to recycle its carbon because as i mentioned earlier one of the amazing things about earth is that it's had surface liquid water for more than 4 billion years and so when you think about that like how on earth has the earth been able to pull off this trick and the answer is is that the earth is able to store its carbon away so the earth has plate tectonics and the one of the consequences of plate tectonics where you have one plate moving under another plate is that it's drawing the carbon from the atmosphere through erosion and dissolving in the ocean and forming carbonate rocks at the seafloor it's storing the carbon back inside the earth and then later on that carbon comes back out through, through volcanism but it's got this constant process which is moderating the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere so if you lose that ability that you can no longer store the carbon um then it all ends up in the atmosphere and that's essentially what happened with venus uh all of its carbon is stored in the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide which creates these incredibly incredibly hot temperatures so um uh, there's a there's a lot that we don't know about venus because during the 60s and 70s and 80s the the russians were obsessed with venus the because the, one of the interesting things from a science fiction point of view is that uh early in the 20th century there were uh, a lot of people were obsessed with mars 
And that's because um, later in the 19th century, there were people like Percival Lowell and others who were speculating that there was life on Mars, a civilization on Mars. They thought they saw canals. That's what resulted in the, the famous H.G. Wells story, War of the Worlds. And then there was a broadcast, the famous Orson Welles one in the 1930s, where uh, he he had, did a reading of H.G. Wells as a news broadcast and people freaked out because they thought the Martians were. So there was, it's interesting to think that there was a period of history less than a hundred years ago when a large fraction of the population believed that there was a, a, an advanced civilization on Mars and that they could come and attack us. Uh, and that those, those ideas Mars went back. away. <laughs> But the, but those ideas went away. And the reason is, is because Mars has a thin atmosphere and we can see the surface. And when we eventually built better telescopes and we figured out, oh, actually, it's just a dead fucking rock, then, uh, then the people stopped thinking like that. And so by the time you get into the late 30s and the 40s, people are no longer thinking about Mars. What they were thinking about next was Venus. Because Venus, we could not see the surface. It was covered in clouds. And so a lot of the science fiction about Venus persisted up until in the mid-1960s when it was imagined as this lush kind of uh, rainforest, maybe humid jungle environment. And for some reason, many of the science fiction stories uh, depicted dinosaurs. On, on on the surface of I, I don't know why they went with dinosaurs but yeah you know, <laughs> but a lot of the stories have that and so the both NASA and the Soviet space program became obsessed with trying to land on the surface of Venus and, and find this life everybody believed that there was life on Venus and so the Soviets were landing all kinds of things they had a, a very successful program called the Venera program and they returned our very first images from the surface of another planet uh, I think it was uh, 1975 when they actually landed on the surface of Venus and were able to take pictures that preceded our first pictures on the surface of uh, Mars uh, but we uh, that we figured it out that it was actually a completely hostile environment. There's no chance of any life there. Uh, but we still don't understand why. We don't understand why our twin planet turned out completely different from the Earth. And that's one of the fundamental uh, problems in planetary science at, at the present time. How do you get two planets that start out with the same conditions are the same size uh but they evolved completely differently uh so that and so i spend a lot of my research working on this problem because i think solving that problem the difference between venus and earth is a big part of the key to understanding planetary habitability in general what makes a planet habitable how does it change with time and uh, what that could mean for planets around other stars, exoplanets, like we're talking about. Is that when people bring up the idea that there was an advanced civilization that went and kind of destroyed itself with like nuclear war, and then that's how you got where Venus is now, where it might just be this irradiated planet? Yeah, I've heard that as as well before uh, as well. That there is, I mean, I've I've heard all kinds of uh, interesting ideas that actually that actually life started on Venus and then they messed up their planet and then, and then they moved to earth and now we're messing this one up. You know, it's kind of history repeating itself. I, it's, it's pretty interesting. Some of the ideas I've heard about. That. They're good to like just hear and not really good to like follow. I would say um, I definitely think that if we talk about the carbon problem that Venus has, um, I think that a lot of that might be due to the fact that we talk about like this carbon capture idea or carbon storage, I would say trees do the same thing here on a small scale. But the issue is that when they burn, they release that carbon into the atmosphere. So it's kind of like a bank, you're just kind of saving it for a short amount of time. If we look at Venus, and I'm looking at the surface of it as your screen right now, I mean, if we're able to get what's going to be easier, get more water onto the planet to start this process, or is there a way that we can either use, like you can use the same thing with nano 
nanotechnology. I mean, is there a way to be able to somehow add something into the atmosphere like we do with weather manipulation? Um, HARP, I would say, might have a capability in some aspects if there's enough research that gets put in there. Because the main direction, if you're talking about living on Venus right now, it would probably be like up in the sky, propulsion systems. I agree with Bill Nelson on that. But also, you can't just live in the sky. You're not a bird. You got you need the ground. OK, so we look at some aspects of I mean, unless we can find some type of ter- uh, I would say surface age. And what I mean by surface age is like we can check through terrestrial impacts onto Earth and really be able to date things through the carbon. We're able to pull out layers of this was this specific time period. This was this specific time period. This was this specific time period. That would be so valuable if we could do that with Venus. If we can just check the like the layers like a cake, be able to check what happened here, what happened here, what happened here. Not necessarily saying like, oh, there was this that happened. But if you're able to find a specific gap when the layers were completely different and there was just a long period of time where it might be just one specific layer, you might be able to predate something there out of that. Yeah, the, well, so one of the things that we do know about Venus is that the surface is all, all not all, most of the surface is, is approximately the same age, which is about 700 million years. There, there appears to have been a resurfacing event that happened uh, almost a billion years ago. Uh, we're not quite sure what the process there, there is, but the, the way in which we measured that was from uh, craters. Uh, and what we call crater counts, because assuming that um, that impacts occur relatively evenly distributed on, on, on a planet, you can look at uh, the different amounts of craters at different locations and get an idea of relative ages of different parts of the planet. So we do have uh, some uh, approximation of the age like that, but there's a lot about the geology that that we don't uh, that that we don't uh, understand, and so. Uh, if, if we, this is another case where if we wanted to terraform Venus, uh, like you said, the short-term solution is clouds, uh, like cities in the clouds. The thing that makes me very nervous about that is that the consequences of losing altitude would be You're dead. severe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I don't, I don't know if I'd ever want to live in a house that's suspended over an acid pit, you know, Look, basically. It's... <laughs> sign this waiver and we're going to send you up there. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's like when I, when I bought my first house in California, uh, because it's California, you have to sign all these disclosures that say that, that you understand by signing this, you understand that during the, in the event of an earthquake, that the ground takes on liquid properties. And it's like, it's a, it's a terrifying document to read, <laughs> honestly. Well, um, if you look at the aspect of like, maybe we talk about underground living. I mean, maybe if we can peel through that surface layer and you might find different conditions that might be inside of the planet. I mean, that's a possibility. I mean, the desert gets cold at night because the sun's not out anymore. And, you know, it's, but during when the sun is up, it's severely hot, you know, it's the complete opposite conditions. Yeah. Unfortunately that doesn't help on Venus because as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's has a uniform surface uh, temperature because it has this giant atmospheric blanket on it. And the other thing is that it's an extremely slow rotator. Um, uh, and so it's almost tidally locked to the sun. Uh, so it is. it takes 243 days to rotate once. And it takes 225 days to go around the sun. So that means it takes longer to rotate than it does to orbit the sun, which is the complete opposite of the Earth. Uh, so it has, has that effect going on. And so... Um, that living underground on Venus, I don't think would be a viable solution because you still at some point have to contend with the surface conditions. And so you'd need to think about that. There have been ideas about terraforming Venus. Um, and one of them is essentially, and as we've discussed earlier, these are all you know long, long-term solutions. Generations down the line are going to benefit from this. But the first step is to essentially put a giant star shade in front of Venus uh, and allow the temperature to drop. And what will happen is that the atmosphere will cool off to the point where it reaches the triple point of carbon dioxide, which is essentially this intersection between liquid gas and solid phases. And what happens at that, at that temperature is that 
the carbon dioxide will rain out of the atmosphere. And so you let that happen for a couple of hundred years. And then, uh, then uh, now you have an ocean of, of, of uh, liquid carbon dioxide, which you can then freeze and store away. There's all kinds of, that, that's where it starts to get um, uh, very complicated about how you deal now with all of this carbon dioxide that you've removed from the atmosphere, crashing comets into it to, uh, you know, to add liquid water back in. These are, the, it, it would be a lot of effort. And um, I talk about this in my class as well about if you decide to terraform a planet, you would need to do so like we was talking about from a model-based perspective. If you're doing this over hundreds of years, you don't want to do all of that, go to all of that effort. And then after several hundred years, it turns out that your data was incorrect and the planet turns out even worse than when you started or you know something terrible like that. But even if it does turn out the way that you want, it's going to be a huge amount of effort such that you would need to uh, calculate the cost benefit. And I'm not talking necessarily from a, from a financial or business point of view, but just in terms of how you're using your planetary resources, uh, that, that this would be a useful thing to do, you know, other than just doing it for kicks and giggles or to have uh, a, a, an alternate place to live in case we do mess up the earth uh, irreparably, um, which I don't think is likely. But, um, but it, it's, it's difficult to calculate what the actual cost of all of these programs for both Venus and Mars, what that would end up being. I think Mars would be your better option um, just because it seems like it's a little bit less work than what it would be for Venus, at least in the direction that we've been heading. And I think I know that's why you mentioned that's probably the direction we are going in is with Mars. Um, but I also yes, think- Yes, Mars, we can send people there now. Venus it would take hundreds of years before we could even send anybody. I'm not saying we shouldn't start like working on being able to do that. But at the same time, we should probably have more eggs in a certain basket that we can make more capable, which would be Mars. Um, but I also think that you have to really, as human species, we have to get over this idea that we want things to be similar to what we had before. And that is not in any type of research that I've looked at has ever been what we've been going in. I mean, Alpha Centauri, similar conditions to Earth. Is it just similar conditions to Earth? Have there not been any others? Or is it just the idea that it can kind of look similar to Earth? You know, it's more close to home. We resonate with that more. I mean, there's certain things people like about their everyday lifestyle that they don't want to change. If you're talking about living on a planet like Mars, for a lot of people, they're like, I don't want to live on Mars. Because you, you want it to be built up to how you want it to look similar to Earth. And that necessarily might not be the route that is the best option. You might want to think about how if you're going to live on a different planet, you're going to have a different lifestyle. And the lifestyle is not going to be similar to Earth. There are conditions you're going to have to pay. If that means staying in a bubble for a certain amount of time. If that means you know taking certain trips when the climate is not as harsh as it was before you have to accept those conditions but living in a dome for a lot of people isn't a great option because they can't have this free range like they do on earth as far as we know there's no dome around us right now so i i think that's a scary thing for a lot of people so they're like i'll wait till it gets to a safer point and i go sometimes you got to accept the uncomfortability of things i mean if you're going to go to a new planet and that's why we have people that are sent there because they're willing to accept that bargain. I think at the same time for your psychological aspect too, you got to accept that it's not going to be anything similar to what you've ever encountered before. And I think we, Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, uh, a, one of my colleagues studies earth history and he likes to refer to different stages of earth history as alternative earths. When you look at earth history, there are, there are various points. Um, in earth history where if you were in a time machine and you teleported to various points in earth history then you would immediately die it would essentially be in a, like on a, on a different planet the atmosphere is different uh climate is different everything's different um uh and and so it the earth has has changed a lot uh over the four billion years like i said the one of the one constants has been the presence of surface liquid water but that's just referring to temperature range 
the 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 atmosphere and many other things about the earth have changed about the 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 landscape the 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 plant life that that has been here uh and so there's a lot of things that uh i i agree that you know when we're when we're thinking about an an exoplanet um one of the interesting things you mentioned was about uh the possibility of uh of people feeling a resonance with alpha centauri because it's close and one of the uh probably the most common question i get asked when i make a new exoplanet discovery is how far away is it that's what people want to know and i and there's a, a lot of my colleagues uh who are particularly interested in the alpha centauri system because i think they understand that there is a cultural resonance with places that are close and so um if we go to Alpha Centauri system and find that indeed there is some kind of habitable location as depicted in in Avatar, which is that that's set in the Alpha Centauri system, but but it's not going to look like uh, look like Earth. Um, it's going to be completely different. It will evolve completely separately. Uh, like I said, even you know the differences with Earth over time. Uh, the the analogy is you know. Uh, also in time travel movies, you know, people go back to medieval times and just talk to the locals. Whereas in reality, we know that the boundary of you being able to understand English is probably around about Shakespeare. And even that is, if you went back further in time than Shakespeare, you wouldn't understand what people are, are, are saying to you. It's, it's like that in the way in which Earth as a planet has changed through time. But if you have a completely different planet, which has had its own separate pathway, um, it's going to be even more alien uh, than various other parts of Earth history. So it's something that we need to manage our expectations about, I think, when we, when we think about um, the, the prospect of finding another planet, uh, a planet in another system, and we, we hear about, oh, you know, maybe uh, it's a habitable planet. What everybody thinks of is Earth, but not just Earth, Earth at the present uh, epoch. So Earth at an age of four and a half billion years. But if we find uh, a, a planet, because that's the other thing, not, not all the planets that we're finding around other stars, they're not all four and a half billion years old. And in fact, they're probably all different ages. Everything in our solar system is four and a half billion years old. Mars is, Venus is, Earth is because they form together. But when we're looking at planets around uh, other stars, um, they're 8 billion years old, 2 billion years old. If you look at the Earth when it was only 2 billion years old, like I said, it looks nothing like it, it does now. Uh, and so people need to get out of their heads <laughs> when we're talking about a planet around another star that formed completely differently and is not even the same age as Earth. They need to get Earth out of their head. Completely. Uh, and maybe it's something that we can engineer to look like a, that's a different discussion, you know, but when we, when we find something that could have surface liquid water, and maybe it's, a, it's habitable. That means something very different from present earth. Well, are we talking about the aspect of, do you want to be comfortable or do you want it now? If you, yeah, want, right. if you want it now, it's not going to be ready for you the way you want it. It's going to be a little bit difficult and you're going to have to make some sacrifices to make sure it'll work. But you could, you, we have the technology in a lot of aspects to make a lot of this very, very feasible. It's going to take people say like years to, you know, it could take six months or something like that to make it to Alpha Centauri. I go, well, I mean, you look at an aspect of like, um, maybe that's not true. It's not going to be six months, but you know, you look at aspects of things when we talk about, oh, we'll wait till our technology gets there to hibernate and do all these types of things. Or you could just take the voyage and make the sacrifice to the aspect. You might not be the one that gets to enjoy the aspects of living on that planet. I mean, if you want it now, if you want these things that say we should be there, we should be this, we should be that. People always compare the Jetsons. How come we don't have flying cars? I mean, we we could have a lot of things that are very, very more advanced in a sense. I mean, we do have things that are more advanced than what was in the Jetsons. It's a freaking cartoon lasted like 15 minutes. But you, you get this aspect of like you have things that you can accomplish and can do now, but is it necessarily the image that you wanted in? And I think you have to kind of make this deal where it's like it's we're not going to get there if you want it like that you're gonna have to give us time but at the same time if you want to get there now we can do that 
It's just going to be in a very different way than how you want it. And I think once people can accept that, and I think this also comes with how society has gone. We see society influences, you know, science. The direction that we're heading in is on the basis of why do we have more iPhones than we do with other types of technology that happen to do with more research advanced stuff? Well, it's because the general public gets to come into interactions with these, you know, these black mirror devices that are in our pockets. You know, that's that's an issue. And I think that's a very large importance of open science as well, too. You know, when you're able to like you're doing here with me, you're able to talk about things and show people a lot of these aspects of things, even if it's on TV. TV. Even talking about the alien subject is good to a point because you're now having more people get interested in trying to do more research to figure it out and understand what these things are. And I think that's going to push us in a new direction. But if I had to ask you, when it comes to Venus, again, if we're talking about colonizing on there or we're talking about some aspect of what's something that we could reasonably do that could affect something like we talk about carbon. I know we talk about like, can we literally just ignite the atmosphere like a nuke scenario? I hate to say it like that, but I mean, if you're able to get rid of that carbon or if we discover a technology that can help rid carbon, you know, get take out like maybe a spray, you know, people bring up these chemtrails. Oh, God, the aliens, all this, you know, they bring in that type of talk. If you're able to spray a chemical in the atmosphere or do something to a point where you could impact it with something i mean comets have that ice to it that's why they got that cometary tail that's ice that's falling off of it if you can impact that and you can literally ice age venus or sn covered in snow eventually how long until that surface starts to change to i guess maybe a happy medium yeah i mentioned the uh the idea of uh essentially putting a pair of sunglasses on venus and cooling it off um but you know uh back in the 70s carl sagan was thinking a lot about terraforming venus and mars and one thing that was it was really interesting the documents because he wrote several documents for nasa like these reports that went to nasa because they were thinking about this it's my grandpa uh, what's that so that's my grandpa your, your your grandpa? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I was like, really? Is How rich. could I not have known? I would this? be rich. No, my last name's not Sagan. <laughs> so, um, but he his documents were talking about uh, an or organic solution, and by that I mean he was thinking about bacteria that metabolize carbon dioxide, of which there are numerous here on Earth that do that, and so he was trying to find solutions where we could find these bacteria and kind of scatter them in the atmosphere of Venus. And over, uh, uh, over many, many years, they would multiply and they would metabolize carbon, you know, it gr gradually do it, do it that way. Um, what was really interesting uh, was that the first document he wrote about this, if I recall correctly, he wrote one about Venus saying, oh yeah, we could do this. Um, and then a few years later, he wrote one about Mars, suggesting a very similar kind of solution because Mars, although it has much uh, uh, more tenuous atmosphere, it's still dominated by carbon dioxide. And so he thought he could use the same trick. However, in his second document, he said, here is a solution that I think would work, but we definitely should not do this. And so in the space in between those two documents, he seemed to have had some kind of uh, an ethical dilemma about introducing biology as a solution to terraforming a, a, a planet uh, as just not being worth the risk in terms of what that biology could do later on. Uh, it, it could end up horribly bad. It could grow something that necessarily you can't stop now. And then you end up, it's just like moving wolves to a certain area. I think they did, they added something to, tear up the deer population they brought like wolves in and then the next thing you know they had a wolf population problem you know that's an issue but you know i think well it's actually the 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 analogy is actually uh really well put uh in terms of what happened in australia in that regard uh, so as yeah so I, uh, as you know i'm originally from australia and australia um the interesting thing about it is that australia was a continent that was cut off from the rest of the world for tens of thousands of years. Um, and as a result, it developed a very specific 
and fragile ecosystem. Uh, and so when the dumbass British settlers came along, they brought with them, they, they, they were bored, they wanted to hunt, they introduced rabbits. Uh, and rabbits, uh, as everybody knows, reproduce extremely quickly and something like that can be destructive to the environment because it can start to take food source, um, even though it supplies food source to other things. And so the rabbits got out of control. And so these, uh, these uh, brilliant, brilliant uh, European colonists thought, well, to solve this, we're going to introduce foxes, which of course made things worse. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it, it, it's kind of like that when we're thinking about the, these things from Mars and Venus, because uh, uh, these are places which are in a very delicate balance. They don't have an ecosystem, but in terms of how we're engineering the planet, this goes back to the thing we've mentioned several times about how uh, complex these systems can be and, and in going down one pathway can have effects that you may not have even thought of. I have came across a couple inventions or ideas, or I guess theories, I would say, um, I, all of them, all that, you could put that all under one umbrella because each design that I've come across is boiled down to the same concept, but has been completely different. One was the Santa Claus machine. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but it was a device that could suck up any material and spit out certain materials. So like, you know how like people talk about like, here's a gun that shoots a building and they shoot and it's a building that pops up. Well, this thing could take any material and then turn it into whatever you needed to build whatever that material was. It could go from taking dirt and turning it into water. I mean, those are that's something that's feasible. It's called a Santa Claus machine. You can look that up. And then there's one that was more feasible that they actually created, which was called the eater machine. I don't know if you ever heard of that one. It goes a little bit darker. Um, which I think is why it was so easily able to be created. But there was an idea of creating a little tiny robot that would eat corpses on the battlefield and spit it out to make like biofuel in a sense, but also be able to run off of this. So you're not only cleaning up um, the battlefield corpses, you're also, you know, creating a machine that can literally sustain itself. And I think when you start talking about the area of AI and drones, maybe humans can't live on Venus's planet. But if you send drones down there to start doing the work for you, it's about making sure that material doesn't melt and is able to sustain those conditions. Now, we have materials now that don't burn up easy, you know, that have a very, very high melting point. So you get to a position where if you have something that can handle those conditions, um, start terraforming the planet in that small sense, you know, a machine that's able to change the landscape in the direction that you want it to go i mean an ai could probably figure out the answer faster than we can well that's been one of the interesting things about the history of venus exploration because the conditions there are so severe and as i mentioned earlier the soviets had a very successful program called venera where they were they landed uh, about 15 of these uh, uh landers on the surface and they they look uh, when you look at that, they look very, very Russian. They're very robust and are like way over engineered for what they needed to be and that like landed on the surface. But they lasted or they transmitted uh, for about an hour or two before they were destroyed. Now, the thing that went first was the electronics, which was not nearly as robust in the 70s as it is now. And what's been interesting is that um, in the decades that have passed, because we haven't actually been back to the surface of Venus since that period of time, since, since the 80s. But in the decades since, the technology, like you said, has, has become far, far more resilient, uh, and in particular, the electronics. Uh, so certainly, we can design the, the chassis that will, that will transport that to the surface, but the electronics itself and, and all of those kinds of mechanisms for the for the lander uh and i because i thought when when i went to a tech some technology programs for venus landers that have been proposed um about a decade ago i thought uh well you know we used to be able to survive a few hours on the surface of venus maybe now it's days now it's actually months and years that we can survive to the point where there are designs for uh rovers for the uh, for the surface of Venus. Now you, we've all seen the pictures of the rovers on Mars. They're kind of like these these spindly looking uh, robots um, uh, that would not survive on Venus. <laughs> but so, but uh, on Venus you can have 
uh, something which is far more in enclosed. Uh, um, uh, it, there, there's a kind of bug that's very commonly seen in gardens that rolls up into a ball. Some people call them roly polies, like yep. they've got this shell. Uh, it, it kind of it it would look like that. It has this exoskeleton and it just would trundle along the the surface of Venus. And an interesting engineering problem with going to the surface of Venus and having a sustained presence like that for robots is uh, counterintuitively, uh, energy is a problem because you think, well, I mean, the Martian rovers, they have these solar panels on the back and that's how they recharge themselves. Uh, but on Venus, very little of the solar radiation that hits the top of the atmosphere actually makes it to the surface. It's only about 3% that makes it to the surface because even so even though venus is closer to the sun than the earth you get very very little solar energy so you can't use solar energy as a solution so they'd need to be like nuclear powered or something like that like the old uh voyager spacecraft the interplanetary missions used to be that's why uh, i brought up the eater machine the eater machine if you have a drone that can scan let's say we scan a little rock or something that's on the surface of venus figure out what material is more percentage wise in that rock then you make that machine live off that material so it could just eat the ground to be able to roll through yeah yeah you have a solution like that or you have this uh have this nuclear powered exoskeleton thing trundling i think that just sounds so awesome <laughs> it's awesome but like you know a lot of people are gonna be like well nuke like people still stray away from nuclear i i don't think nuclear is an issue what i have an issue with is just people like you know we talk about nuclear reactors like for energy people think that's like oh that's now a topic of discussion i would say i, I used to look up on energy.gov and see nuclear energy was like a good way to go i was like holy shit i thought it was going to make you grow a third eye it's not the technology that's an issue. I mean, to implement it at scale that they want to, we don't have that technology yet. Well, we will get there. But I think it's human error as well, too. People, we have this weird aspect of becoming lazy on things, and that's when it becomes a problem. I mean, our, we had nuclear facilities that were 30, 35 years past when they were supposed to be checked. And that's an issue. But I think that's where it scares people with Chernobyl and stuff. It can be done right. But you got to make sure that you're on it. Like we have a very weird relationship and the relationship is business and business has infected everything. It's much like politics has infected so much. I mean, it's influenced into academia. It's influenced into so much. And I'm like, we got to find ways to slowly take out those ties of things. I mean, I don't think people's research should be so you shouldn't be funded by one institution. It should be funded by at least 30. So you don't you, you don't worry so much about pissing one particular funder off. Yeah, yeah. And it's like you were saying earlier, uh, when people think about energy solutions, they tend to be in one camp or another, whereas I, I think that we need to be using multiple solutions. I'm all for renewable and solar and that kind of stuff, but I'm also a big advocate of nuclear. Uh, people do uh, tend to think of Chernobyl, <laughs> which has been an unfortunate scar on, on the whole history of, of that endeavor for energy but uh i i think that uh we've come a long way since then we, we've so. come a long way and we're still going a long way we got yeah I'm, I'm down with the space stuff i think it'll be in the next 50 years i don't know about you um space colonization i've talked to too many people that are now thinking about the idea more than they did maybe like my buddy haystick i mean he was one of my first people on four years ago and then he didn't think aliens were really still kind of doesn't really entertain it that much but he's definitely changed his perspective on some things where I, I really like the discussions and the thoughts he's been having compared to our first episode where I was just like, I like this because I think it's with society. We're changing a lot, not only aspect of like, you know, caring more about Earth, but on the aspect of like just being more open to the idea of space. I bet if you took a poll now compared to a poll 30 years ago, you have a lot more people with interest in the stars than they did before. Yeah, I think that's probably true. And um yeah, so to clarify, I, I I don't think we'll be getting to an exoplanet anytime soon, but the the fifty year time scale you mentioned for our solar system, I think, is uh, perfectly reasonable. Uh, so I I think colonization of Mars could at least start to happen within that period of time. Um, I my feeling is that uh, Musk is seems really determined on this. And he's going to throw whatever resources he needs to at this problem 
to make sure that it happens within his lifetime at least because there's a fucking prophecy about his name or something like that that's like oh, it's supposed to be some savior to mars you ever hear about that no he was told some like sci-fi story that there was like this hero and this hero in the story was a guy named or elon and elon was like this person from mars or the savior of mars or it's like some john carter shit that i heard <laughs> and i was like that's why he's interested in mars so much and like yeah because it's like a prophecy that he's going i'm like dude what? The oh fuck? my god i <laughs> I had no idea about that. The only reason why he's funneling money into it, that's why a lot of people like scientists wise don't really like uh, talking about Musk that much. Like there's a lot of issues with, like space junk and stuff, but that's like one thing is like, I'm like, yeah, what about Musk going to Mars? I'd be like, it's off of a prophecy. I'm like, what are you so talking about? He sees himself as the chosen one. Yeah. So, I mean, I, Hey, if that gets a guy funneled, sometimes you need that motivation to get you somewhere. You know what I mean? Yeah. Whatever floats his boat. I mean, if that's what is going to get him there, then okay maybe a super highway would actually do something on mars yeah yeah plenty of space for it there <laughs> um steven seriously it's been a pleasure like i said bro i'm going to try and work out a panel date to have everybody on the show um is there a place where people can find your links uh well people can uh find my website at stephenkane.net uh i'm on twitter with the handle exocytherian uh so that's where people can find me i'll make sure i link it all in the description Thanks for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank. Stay tuned for next episode.